Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, happy holidays. Uh, hope, uh, hope sales are good. Uh, I want to spend most of my time, uh, as I usually do, taking questions. I want to thank Randall uh, and uh, the rest of the Executive Committee uh, for the opportunity to speak uh, with you here today. Uh, but let me just give you a sense of where I think our economy currently is, uh, what's happening around the world, and where I think it should be, and uh, the chances for us here in Washington to accelerate rather than impede some of the progress that we've made. Um, you know, around this time, six years ago, uh, America's businesses were shedding about 800,000 jobs per month. Uh, today, uh, our businesses, including uh, some of the most uh, important businesses in the world uh, that are represented here today, have created over 10.6 million new jobs, 56 months of uninterrupted job growth, which is uh, the longest private sector job growth uh, in our history. We just saw the best six-month period of economic growth in over a decade. Uh, for the first time in six years, the unemployment rate is under 6 percent. Uh, all told, the United States of America over the last six years have put more people back to work than Europe, Japan, and the rest of the advanced world combined. Uh, and that's a record for us to build on. Uh, at the same time, what we've been doing is working on restructuring and, and rebuilding uh, our economy for sustained long-term growth. Uh, manufacturing's grown. Uh, the auto industry has the strongest sales since 2007. Uh, our deficits have shrunk by about two-thirds, something that very few people, I suspect, in the BRT would have anticipated in some of our conversations three or four years ago. Uh, when it comes to health care costs, uh, premiums, uh, have gone up at the lowest pace on record, which means that uh, a lot of the businesses here are saving money, as are a lot of consumers. Uh, on the education front, uh, high school graduations are up, college enrollments are up, math and reading scores have improved. Uh, internationally, our exports uh, continue to hit record levels. Uh, on energy, we have seen a revolution that is changing not just the economy, but uh, are also changing uh, geopolitics. Uh, not only is oil and natural gas production up, in part because of technological changes that have taken place, uh, but we've also doubled uh, our production of clean energy. Uh, and solar energy is up about tenfold, wind energy is up threefold. Uh, unit costs uh, for the production of clean energy are dropping down to where they're getting close to being competitive to fossil fuels. Uh, and as a consequence, we've also been able to reduce carbon emissions uh, that cause uh, climate change uh, faster than uh, most of the other uh, industrialized countries. So the bottom line is, is that America continues to lead. I was, uh, Andrew Liveris and I were talking, I was in his, uh, uh, with his people uh, in Brisbane, Australia. and. At the G20, uh, what was striking was the degree of optimism that the world felt about the American economy, um, an optimism that in some ways is greater than how Americans sometimes feel about the American economy. Uh, I think what you saw among world leaders uh, was consistent with what we know uh, from global surveys, which is when you ask people now, where's the number one place to invest? It's the United States of America. Uh, it was China for quite some time. Uh, now folks want to put money back into this country. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that we've got the best workers in the world, we've got the best university system and research and development and innovation in the world, uh, and we've got the best businesses in the world. Uh, and so uh, a lot of you can, I think, take uh, great credit uh, for uh, the kind of bounce back that we've seen over the last six years. Having said all that, I think we recognize that we've got a lot more progress to make. Um, and, and I'd put it in a couple of categories. Uh, there are some common sense things that we should be doing uh, that we're not doing. And uh, the reason primarily is because of politics and uh, ideological gridlock. Uh, but I suspect that if we surveyed folks here, regardless of your party affiliation, uh, you'd say, let's get this done. Uh, infrastructure, 
is one area where we need to go ahead and make some significant investments. Anybody who travels around the world uh, and, and looks at what airports outside the United States now look like and roads and trains and ports and airports now look like, uh, uh, recognize that uh, it makes no sense for us to have a first-class economy but second-class infrastructure. Uh, and that would not only help accelerate growth right now, it would also lay the foundation for growth in the future. Um, tax reform, uh, an area which I know is of great interest uh, to the Business Roundtable. Uh, I have consistently said that for us to have a system in which we have on paper uh, one of the two or three highest tax rates in the world uh, when it comes to corporate taxation, uh, but in practice there are so many loopholes that you get huge variations between what companies pay. It uh, doesn't make sense, and we should be able to smooth it, uh, the system out, streamline it in such a way that allows us to lower rates, close loopholes, uh, and uh, make for a much more efficient system uh, where folks aren't wasting a lot of time trying to uh, hire accountants and lawyers to get out of paying taxes but have some certainty, uh, and we're able to raise just as much money on a much simpler system. Uh, that's something that uh, I think we should be doing. Uh, trade. In Asia, there is a great hunger for engagement with the United States of America, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, is moving forward. Uh, Michael Froman, who's here, uh, has been working nonstop. Uh, I've promised uh, his family that uh, he will be home sometime soon. Um, we, we are optimistic about being able to get a deal done, and we are reinvigorating the negotiations with uh, the Europeans on the uh, transatlantic trade deal. Uh, if we can get that done, that's good for American businesses, it's good for American jobs, uh, and it's actually good for labor and environmental interests around the world because what we're trying to do is raise standards so that everybody's on a higher but level playing field. Uh, and I think that uh, your help uh, on that process can make an enormous difference. Immigration reform. I recognize that there's been some controversy about the executive actions that I've taken. Uh, on the other hand, I think the BRT uh, has been extraordinarily helpful in getting the country to recognize that this is the right thing to do for our economy. We know it will grow the economy faster. We know it will help us reduce the deficit. We know that it gives us the capacity to bring in high-skill uh, folks who we should want to gravitate towards the United States to start businesses. Uh, and to create new products and new services and to innovate and to continue the tradition of uh, uh, economic dynamism uh, that's the hallmark of the United States of America. Uh, I am still hopeful that we can get legislation done because if we get legislation done, uh, it actually supplants a lot of the executive actions that I've already taken, which I've acknowledged are incomplete, uh, allow us to make some progress, but they're temporary, uh, and we could be doing a lot better if we actually get uh, legislation done. So the good news, uh, despite uh, the fact that uh, obviously the midterm elections did not turn out exactly as I had hoped, uh, is that there remains enormous areas of uh, potential bipartisan uh, action and progress. Uh, and I've already spoken to Speaker Boehner and uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, uh, and what I've said to them is that uh, I am prepared to work with them on areas where we agree, recognizing there are going to be some areas where we just don't agree. Uh, and I think one of the habits that this town has to break is this notion that if you disagree on one thing, then suddenly everybody takes their ball uh, home and uh, they don't play. Uh, I think that there's got to be the capacity for us to say, here's an area where we're going to have some vigorous disagreement, but here are some areas where uh, we have a, uh, a common vision. Let's go ahead and get that done and build some momentum, uh, start uh, working those muscles uh, to actually legislate, uh, sign some legislation, uh, give the American people some confidence that uh, those of us who have this extraordinary privilege of being uh, placed in leadership uh, are able to actually deliver for the American people. Uh, one final point that I'll make. Uh, I, I started off by talking about how generally optimistic I am about the economic trends. Uh, there are some 
concerns on the horizon. Obviously, Japan being weak, Europe uh, being weak, uh, means that uh, the United States, uh, even as we chug along, uh, could be uh, pulled back uh, by, by global weakness, uh, not only in, in Europe and Japan, but also the emerging markets. So we're monitoring that and we're working internationally to try to uh, get uh, Europe in particular to, to uh, see stronger growth. Um, but domestically, the area where uh, I have uh, the deepest concern is the fact that although corporate profits uh, are at the highest levels in 60 years, the stock market's up 150 uh, percent. Wages and incomes still haven't uh, gone up significantly and certainly have not picked up uh, the way they did uh, in earlier generations. That's part of what's causing this quiet uh, in the general public, even though the aggregate numbers look good. Uh, and one thing I'd like to work with the BRT on uh, is to ask some tricky questions, but important questions, about how we can make sure that prosperity is broad-based. Uh, I actually think when you look at the history of this country, um, when wages are good, and consumers feel like they got some money in their pocket, that ends up being good for business, not bad for business. Uh, I think most of you would agree to that. Uh, and uh, we got a lot of good corporate citizens in this room. Unfortunately, the overall trend lines, though, have been, even as productivity and profits go up, wages and incomes uh, as a share of overall GDP have shrunk. Uh, and, and that's part of what is creating an undertow of pessimism, despite generally good economic news. Um, I think there's some concrete things we can do to address that, uh, and I'm going to be looking forward to working with the BRT uh, to see if we can uh, make progress on those fronts as well. All right? So with that, let's open it up for questions. Uh, Randall, do you want to call on folks, or do you want me if, to if just I go could ahead? and start Please, the I'm first question, and then uh, we'll do that. Go ahead. Uh, your comments are, have been consistent as it relates to tax reform. We have been, over the last couple of days, talking a lot about what are those things that are most critical for driving job growth, middle income job growth? Right. And it always, for us, comes back to investment. The more we invest, the more we hire, the more middle income wages grow. And as we think about what are those things that will drive business investment and that kind of job growth, you've touched on it and you have been consistent, tax reform. And uh, to us, there is no single factor that could be more important. And the question is, uh, do you think it would be useful to have somebody with your administration, within your administration that you appoint and say, this is a priority to me. We will work with the individual and Congress and just see if this is a priority, if we can drive this through. There's a time frame here, it seems like, to us where there's something that could be done. Both sides of Congress seem receptive, and so we'd be really open to working with you, somebody specifically in your administration, to help you drive this through. Well, uh, Jack Lewis here, our, our Treasury Secretary, and my understanding is he doesn't have enough to do, so I'm thinking. <laughs> Uh, I'm thinking maybe we need to put him to work. Uh, uh, let, let me get a little more detailed about uh, the prospects for tax reform. Uh, we put out uh, a white paper, a general concept on uh, corporate tax reform, uh, several years ago when Tim Geithner was still Treasury Secretary. I think uh, the BRT uh, has had an opportunity to take a look at what our basic principles uh, have been. Uh, they've been consistent. The idea has been closed loopholes, lower rates. Uh, uh, we have discussed the possibility of being able to bring in uh, some uh, of uh, the, the dollars that are trapped outside of the country right now uh, and in a one-time uh, transaction potentially use that to pay for some infrastructure improvements. Uh, I think there is some uh, openness to that and uh, when you compare what we put forward with what Dave Camp, uh, the, uh, the current uh, House Ways and Means uh, chairman put out, uh, his principles for tax reform, uh, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, there are some differences, but overall, conceptually, he also believes lower rates, closed loopholes, um, a minimum tax uh, globally that ensures that folks aren't gaming the system, but also allows you to be competitive with uh, folks uh, based in other countries that are operating on a territorial basis. Uh, 
so there is there is definitely a deal to be done. Uh, I think two big hurdles that we're going to have to get over. Uh, the first is the classic problem, which is people are in favor of tax reform in the abstract and sometimes more concerned with tax reform in the specifics. If we are, in fact, going to accomplish revenue neutral corporate tax reform that substantially lowers the corporate rate, then we have to go after some uh, deductions that people are very comfortable with. And there are going to be some winners and there are going to be some losers in the short term. Over long term, there's going to be less distortion in the economy and capital will be allocated more sensibly. But in the short term, there are going to be some winners and losers, including in this room. The question then becomes, are folks willing and ready to go ahead and make that move uh, for the sake of uh, a simpler, more streamlined, more sensible tax system? Uh, because if not, it's not going to happen. Uh, you know, uh, all of you representing this room have employees and businesses and plants all across the country in every congressional district. And if we don't have consistency and unity coming out of uh, our top companies, then we're going to have, uh, I think, the likelihood of, of us being able to get something done is, is low. The second problem uh, is one that is solvable but is tricky. And that is, uh, Paul Ryan, at least in the past, has stated that, and, and I think Boehner has echoed this, that they don't want to just do corporate tax reform. They're interested in also combining that with individual tax reform, in part because they're concerned about pass-through corporations not being able to benefit the way uh, uh, larger companies do. And we are actually committed to providing simpler and lower tax rates for small businesses as well. Um, but what we're not willing to do is to, um, to structure a tax deal in which either it blows up the deficit, essentially we can't pay for the revenue that's lost, uh, or, uh, alternatively, that you get tax shifting from businesses to middle class and working families. Uh, and so when you start introducing the individual side, it gets more complicated in terms of who's benefiting, what are the rates, how is it restructured. Uh, my view is, is that if we start with the corporate side, it's a more discrete problem fewer variables, fewer moving parts, we may be able to get that done, and then we can potentially have a conversation about broader tax reform. Um, that may not be how the Republicans uh, uh, view the situation. Uh, and so that, th and, and that could end up being a hang-up. One last point I would make, and this relates to the issue of, of, of individual tax reform, but it also relates to one of the debates that was taking place during this lame duck period, and that is about tax extenders. Um, as a general rule, uh, we are open to short-term uh, extensions of many of those provisions uh, to make sure that all of you are be able to engage in basic tax planning at least uh, for the next couple of years and, and are not um, having to scramble during tax time figuring out what exactly the rules are. But, but more broadly, we'd like to see if some of those tax extenders provisions, including things that I strongly support like research and development, are incorporated into a broader uh, comprehensive uh, tax reform package. In order to do that, though, I also want to make sure that some provisions that benefit working families are included in that package. The children's, uh, the, the child tax credit, hugely important for a lot of working families. Uh, the EITC, uh, earned income tax credit, hugely important for a lot of working families, you know, something that has historically been supported on a bipartisan basis because it encourages work, 
but it says if you're working full time, we're going to try to do everything we can to make sure that you're not in poverty uh, when you're doing the right thing and taking responsibility. Um, there is a uh, college tuition tax credit that benefits a lot of families, sometimes families who get caught. They're not quite poor enough to qualify for Pell Grants, uh, but they don't have enough money to be able to really manage college costs. So there are going to be some working class and, 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 and middle class and uh, working family provisions uh, that have to be incorporated if we are to extend uh, some of these other uh, uh, tax deductions and tax breaks as well. Uh, but that uh, hopefully gives you a sense of optimism on my part, uh, but cautious optimism. I think that there are going to be uh, some, some real challenges, uh, but we are absolutely committed to working with uh, Speaker Boehner and, and Mitch McConnell, uh, as well as the BRT and other interests, uh, in seeing if we can get this thing done. I think the time is right, and you're right, uh, Randall, that uh, the window is not going to be uh, open too wide, uh, and it's going to start narrowing uh, the closer we get into the next presidential election, which always seems to start uh, the day after the last election. So. Mr. President, uh, over here, Maggie yeah. Wilderotter with Frontier Communications. Thank you for being with us. And also thank you for uh, explaining a little bit more what you're thinking about for tax reform. Mm -hmm. I, I also want to just uh, underline that the tax extenders, until there is some reform that takes place, is really important to all of us in this room. Right. As Randall mentioned, it is about capital investment that really drives income growth for, for middle class families. Our company serves 30,000 communities in rural America, so that is important to us. Right. One of the other things that's important to us is the continuing resolution to keep the government going. Can you Me talk? too. Yes. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about uh, how we make sure that we don't have bits and starts again on that subject? Um, I've been encouraged by recent statements uh, by Speaker Boehner and uh, Leader McConnell about their interest in uh, preventing another government shutdown, uh, and I take them at their word. Um, look, uh, the federal government budgeting process generally uh, is, how should I put it, not ideal. Uh, ideally, we would have longer time frames greater certainty. Uh, we would be able to distinguish between capital investments that are going to have long-term payoffs and uh, short-term operating expenses. Uh, historically, that's just not been how the budget process has been structured. Uh, and since the plane is constantly flying, it's, it's hard to get in there. Maybe Jim has advice about how to how to switch up engines while uh, the, planes, uh, the plane's in the air. So, so the, the tendency is just to uh, kick the can down the road uh, with a series of continuing resolutions. Um, there has been an effort to try to get back to regular procedures uh, and to systematically look through these budgets. Uh, there was talk of uh, an omnibus uh, bill uh, rather than a, uh, a continuing resolution, uh, and I think it will be useful for you to get directly from the speaker what their intentions are at this point. Uh, but the one thing I can say for certain is that no one benefits by the government shutting down, and it is entirely unacceptable for us not to uh, maintain the full faith and credit of the United States government. And we just cannot afford to engage in that kind of brinksmanship uh, that we saw over the last couple of years. Each time that happened, consumer sentiment plunged. It was a self-inflicted wound, uh, and we had to dig ourselves back out of a hole despite all the efforts that had been made, uh, simply because uh, people's uh, confidence in the system overall was shaken. Uh, so my strong hope is, is that we don't repeat that. And, and part, of the, part of the principle that uh, can prevent that is what I already articulated. We have to be able to disagree on some things whilst going ahead and, and uh, managing the people's business and, and working on the things where we do agree. Uh, you know, democracy is messy, uh, but it doesn't have to be chaos. 
Uh, and and I, uh, I, I've been encouraged, as I said, uh, so far uh, by uh, statements uh, by Republican leadership. And, and if, in fact, we can get some certainty on the budget, at least for the next year, that then gives us the window to work on tax reform. The good news is, in all this, uh, is the incredible progress we've made on our short-term deficits. Um, nobody talks about them anymore. I, I, I will say that's one of the frustrating things about Washington is, you know, people are really good about hollering about problems, and then when we solve them, nobody talks about them. Uh, we have made extraordinary progress in reducing our short-term deficits. We still have some long-term liabilities that we've got to worry about. Uh, and uh, some of those problems, though, have been addressed or are being addressed by changes in the health care delivery system, which has been a huge driver of long-term uh, federal debt. Um, you know, uh, I think I mentioned earlier that health care inflation has gone up at the slowest rate in 50 years, far slower than had been projected by CBO or by um, the actuaries for uh, Medicare. As a consequence, we've, we're, we've already been able to book about $188 billion in savings over the next 10 years uh, in reduced health care outlays. Uh, and I actually think that we can get more done as some of the delivery system reforms that we talked about uh, and are initiating through the Affordable Care Act are put in place. So, so there's good news on the budget, uh, but now what we've got to do is to, to create a framework in which not only do we keep our deficits low and we're able to start driving down our debt, but we're also able to make some core investments that I mentioned earlier in, uh, in infrastructure, uh, in education, and particularly early childhood education is an area where I think we can make a lot of progress. Uh, in basic research and science, I was out at NIH yesterday talking to a woman who had worked 10 years on the Ebola virus in great obscurity uh, until suddenly everybody thought she was pretty interesting. Uh, and we're in the process now of, of uh, phase two trials on uh, an Ebola vaccine. Uh, but that kind of basic research investment uh, is part of what keeps us at, at, at a leading edge. So if we can create a budget structure that allows us to make those investments, keep deficits low, streamline our tax system, uh, and I think uh, the opportunities for uh, uh, American preeminence economically uh, are, are very, very high. Yeah, Doug. President, good morning. Welcome. Thank you good for joining you. us. Uh, the four things you mentioned in your earlier comments, infrastructure, immigration, tax, and trade are sweet spots for this group. Uh, there are highest priorities. Uh, any one or any combination or all of them would lead to economic growth, yeah. job creation, and everyone in here wants to grow and everyone wants to add jobs. We all want to raise pay, believe it or not. It, it's oh, I do what believe. we want to do. Yeah. Uh, we'd be interested in your comments on the priorities of those as you look into 15, new Congress, new faces, yeah. certainly a change Senate. What's first, what's second, kind of what's, what's the lineup? Uh, You know, I think it's going to be very important for me to consult with uh, Boehner and McConnell to find out how they want to sequence their efforts, um, because ultimately the challenge on most of this stuff has not been my administration's unwillingness to engage or get it done. It's been the complications of Congress uh, and uh, the challenges uh, they have in their respective caucuses. Uh, my instinct, though, is to get a process started on tax reform early because you need a pretty long runway for that. It takes some time. Uh, as I said, we've already got a, uh, some overlap in, in the frameworks, uh, which will help, but that's probably uh, a full year, six to nine months before uh, we could really solidify something. So getting started on that early understanding there's not going to be a vote anytime soon and there's going to be a lot of contentious debate uh, I, I think would be helpful. With respect to trade, uh, 
we hope to be able to not simply uh, finalize an agreement with the various parties in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but also to be able to explain it to the public and to engage in all the stakeholders and to publicly engage with the critics, because I think some of the criticism of uh, what we've been doing on uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is uh, groups fighting the last war uh, as opposed to looking forward. Uh, and, and so that may be something discreet that we can get done if we're able to have a good, solid debate uh, and everybody feels like it's been transparent and they understand exactly uh, what it is that we're trying to do. Um, uh, I, inf infrastructure, I think, gets wrapped up in tax reform. The challenge for infrastructure has been that um, it's not that I, I, I think my Republican friends don't want infrastructure. I notice whenever I, we get a project going, they're, they're at the ribbon cutting. Um, uh, I think it's the pay force. How, how do you pay for it? And they're very sensitive, as you know, to anything that uh, might be construed as a tax. Of course, it's hard to pay for things if you don't have some sort of revenue stream. Uh, and I've been exploring, you know, uh, had a conversation with Larry Fink uh, a while back, and uh, Larry's been bringing together some, some people to see how we can uh, do more in attracting private investment into infrastructure construction, which is done fairly effectively in a lot of other countries, but that's not been our tradition. So our tax structures uh, and, and, and legal structures are not uh, uh, optimally designed uh, to get private capital uh, and infrastructure. Uh, but we're, we're working on that. But I do think that if we are successful with tax reform, that may give us a, an avenue for a one-time big push uh, on infrastructure. Uh, but it's hard for me to en envision um, this Congress being able to vote on a big infrastructure bill uh, on its own, uh, because uh, I don't know where they would uh, uh, get the money for it. Uh, I've got some proposals, but uh, I don't think uh, they're likely to adopt them. And, and finally, on immigration, I think that's, that's something that probably comes last. I suspect that uh, temperatures need to cool a little bit uh, in the wake of my executive action. Um, Certainly, there will be pressure initially within Republican caucuses to try to reverse what I've done, despite the fact that what I'm doing, uh, I think, is exactly the right thing to do. We have to prioritize how we allocate limited enforcement resources, and we should be focusing on felons. We should not be focusing on breaking up families uh, who are our neighbors and our friends and whose kids go to school with us. Um, it's temporary, uh, and as soon as Congress passes comprehensive legislation, it goes away. But I don't think that uh, that's something that this Congress will be able to do right away. My suspicion is they'll take a couple of stabs at rolling back what I've done, and then perhaps uh, folks will step back and say, well, uh, rather than just do something partial, that we may not be completely satisfied with. Let's engage with the President uh, to see if we can do something more comprehensive that addresses some of our concerns, but also uh, addresses uh, uh, my concerns uh, as well. So uh, I think that's probably the sequence. Get tax reform rolling. Uh, make sure that everybody understands, from my perspective, it's going to have to be balanced. We, we're not going to leave. EITC or the child tra tax credit behind and just do uh, uh, a, a corporate uh, piece on its own. Um, but, if, but if we can get that ball rolling and we can get trade done, and then there's some things that we haven't really talked about. I mentioned, for example, patent reform. There's still more work to do there. Cybersecurity, an area that is of great interest to a lot of people in this room. Some areas that sh shouldn't be ideological at all don't require huge expenditures of money, do require that we reorganize uh, ourselves to respond to, to new challenges and new threats. Uh, 
you know, then you, you could see an environment begin to emerge of uh, productivity in Washington, which would be exciting. I love signing bills. <laughs> All right. David? Could you pro provide a uh, global perspective for us? You were uh, <coughs> recently in China, and them now being the number two economy in the world, us building peaceful commercial ties with them while not turning a blind eye to the things that we know are issues is important. And it feels like you made some progress there with greenhouse gases and other things. And then could you take a moment to talk about some of the trouble spots in the world and how you're thinking about Russia and the Middle East and uh, Korea and what we have to deal with there? Good. Um, well, uh, l let me talk about economics, and then I'll talk about geopolitics. Uh, I have touched on earlier uh, the, the economics, and, and many of you have great analysts, so um, I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know or are not experiencing concretely in your businesses. Um, the United States stands out as an economy that's going strong at the moment. Uh, Japan uh, is uh, contracting in a way that uh, surprised many analysts, and I know surprised Prime Minister Abe. Um, he's got new elections. There's a delay in the consumption tax that uh, the second phase of it that uh, was slated to, to go into effect. Um, they're pursuing fairly aggressive monetary policy, uh, but I don't know whether they're going to be able to pull out of uh, the current variation on what's been a pretty long-term slump anytime soon, and they've still got some debt overhang that they've got to address. In Europe, um, you know, the, the debate has generally been framed as uh, austerity and prudence promoted by the Germans versus uh, a desire for a looser uh, set of fiscal policies uh, among the southern countries. If you look, uh, the truth is, is that Spain, uh, France, uh, to a lesser extent Italy, most of the big countries in the South ha have been engaging in some pretty serious structural reforms. They haven't done everything that they need to do in terms of providing labor flexibility, for example, but they are making strides in addressing many of those issues. Uh, but right now what you've got is a, uh, an environment in which the, the, the dangers of deflation and really weak demand in Europe chronically uh, over a long period of time, uh, I think, are, 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 the, are more significant than dangers of overheating economies and inflation uh, in, in the European Union. Um, and, you know, we have uh, – I joke sometimes that I, I, I'm an honorary member of the European Commission, and Jack certainly is, uh, Tim Geithner before him. Uh, we have spent a lot of time trying to manage through various uh, crises that pop up in Europe. Uh, and, and my concern is, is that because there's not a current financial uh, crisis um, and the markets are relatively calm, that we're not paying enough attention to just the, the overall weakness of, of, of the European economy. Uh, and we keep on poking and prodding, suggesting to them that in our own circumstances, for example, uh, we were able to reduce our deficits in part because, yes, we raised some taxes, but in part because we grew faster. Uh, and if you've just got weaker demand chronically, then it's actually harder to get out of a hole than uh, if you had uh, stronger, uh, stronger investment and stronger demand there. Um, the emerging markets, uh, I think, have, have been slower than anticipated. China uh, has a fairly good rationale for that. They're trying to shift away from a model that was entirely export driven to a model that recognizes they need stronger demand uh, inside of China. Uh, and they got to have uh, a, a nascent but growing middle class start to sp have enough confidence to spend some money. Uh, but that requires a, a complete reorganization of, uh, of their economy. Uh, they've got a real estate situation in part because uh, of state-sponsored uh, 
spending that is always at risk of overheating. Uh, and so the new normal that they're anticipating uh, means that uh, they won't be growing quite as fast as they had before. Uh, you know, if, if they grow at 7 percent, we'd take it. Uh, but for them, that's significantly slower. And that then has ramifications in terms of demand for commodities, which in turn affects a whole lot of uh, emerging markets. Uh, India, Modi, uh, has impressed me so far with his willingness to shake up uh, the, the bureaucratic inertia inside of India. But that is a long-term project, and we'll have to see how successful he is. Uh, Brazil, challenges, but they've got, uh, they just completed an election, and I think they recognize they need to grow faster. So, so I guess the, the, the overall global picture, and uh, Jack, you can correct me if there's anything that uh, I'm saying that's wrong, uh, is uh, people continue to look to America for economic leadership. Uh, we need some other engines to be pulling the global economy along. Uh, and we're pursuing diplomatic policies and uh, consultations to try to encourage that. Um, on the geopolitics, uh, my meeting with President Xi, I thought, was, uh, was very productive. And obviously, we had some significant deliverables. Uh, he has consolidated power faster and uh, more comprehensively than probably anybody since uh, Deng Xiaoping. Uh, and uh, everybody's been impressed by uh, his, you know, his his clout uh, inside of China uh, after only uh, a year and a half or two years. Um, there are dangers in that uh, on issues of human rights, uh, on issues of, of clamping down on dissent. Uh, he taps into a nationalism that uh, worries his neighbors and that we've seen manifest in these uh, maritime disputes in the South China Sea and as well as uh, on the Senkaku Islands. Uh, on the other hand, I think they have a very strong interest in maintaining good relations with the United States. Um, and my visit was uh, a demonstration of their interest in managing this relationship effectively. Our goal with China has been to say to them, we too want a constructive relationship. We've got an integrated world economy, and the two largest economies in the world have to have an effective uh, relationship together. Um, it can be a win-win for both sides, uh, but there's some things we need them to fix. Uh, and we are pressing them very hard on issues of cybersecurity and uh, uh, cyber theft, uh, mostly in the commercial area. It is indisputable that they engage in it, and it is a problem, and we push them hard on it. Uh, one thing the BRT can do is to help us by speaking out when you're getting strong-armed about some of these issues. And I know it's sensitive because you don't want to be necessarily penalized uh, in your operations in China, but that's an area that's important. Uh, same thing with intellectual property. We are pushing them hard on that. One of the ancillary benefits of the Trans-Pacific Partnership is to create high standards in the region that then China has to adapt to as opposed to a race to the bottom where there's no IP protection, for example, uh, uh, and, and China is really setting the terms for how trade and investment uh, should operate. Um, uh, President uh, Xi is interested in a business inve investment uh, treaty. Uh, that could be significant because it could help to change the environment in which you are able to invest in China without being discriminated against uh, relative to uh, domestic firms. Uh, we got a lot of work to do on that, but that's a work stream that we've set up. Um, so uh, I think we have to uh, be cautious uh, and clear-eyed about our relationship with China, but I, there's no reason why we should not be able to manage that relationship in a way that is productive for us and, and productive for the world. Uh, I'm less optimistic about Russia. Uh, I, I have a very direct, blunt, and businesslike relationship with Putin. Um, 
we had a very productive uh, relationship when Medvedev was president, even though Putin was still the power behind the throne, in part because uh, I think the situation in Ukraine caught him by surprise. Uh, he has been improvising himself into a nationalist uh, uh, backward-looking uh, approach to Russian policy that is scaring the heck out of his neighbors and is badly damaging his economy. And sanctions are having a big bite on their economy. We continue to offer them a pathway to a diplomatic resolution of the problem. Um, but the, the challenge is this is working for him politically inside of Russia, even though it is isolating Russia completely internationally. Uh, and, and, and I think people should take note of how unified we have been able to keep the Europeans on sanctions and penalizing Russia for its behavior, despite the fact that it's tough on the Russian economy or, or on the European economy. Uh, but people have recognized there's a a core principle at stake that helped to establish peace in Europe and prosperity in Europe that uh, uh, can't be ignored. Um, but if you ask me, am I optimistic that Putin suddenly changes his mindset, uh, I don't think that will happen until the politics inside of Russia catch up to what's happening in the economy inside of Russia, which is part of the reason why we're going to continue to maintain uh, that pressure. Um, and finally, in the Middle East, uh, you are going through a generational shift, uh, a, a tectonic shift in the Middle East. And it is messy and it is dangerous. Um, part of it is uh, sectarian schisms between Shia and Sunni uh, and, and conflicts between states uh, that engage in proxy fights. Uh, that are far more bloody and, and uh, vicious and significant now than the conflict between Arabs and Jews. Um, and you're seeing that primarily in Iraq uh, and Syria. Uh, and you know, I am confident about our ability to push ISIL back in Iraq. Syria, I think, is a, a broader and longer term a, a, a more difficult long-term proposition, uh, in part because uh, the civil war has gotten so bad uh, and the interests of outside parties are so conflicting that it may take time to, to uh, let that thing uh, settle down. Uh, but obviously we're very active, not just militarily but diplomatically. Uh, the the, the longer-term problem in, in the Middle East uh, is and this relates to the economy. Um, the whole region, in some ways, has gone uh, down a, a blind alley uh, where too often uh, Islam is now equated with rejection of education, modernity, women's participation, all the things that allow you to thrive in a modern economy. Uh, and that's not uniformly true, but too often those forces inside of Islam have been elevated. Uh, and moderate voices and uh, voices that recognize Islam should be compatible with science, education, tolerance, openness, uh, global commerce, productivity. Uh, too often those voices have been silenced. So the question now becomes, are we able to strengthen some of those voices. That, that is a generational project. Uh, and some of the things we're doing, for example, entrepreneurial summits uh, for Muslim small business leaders, uh, that's the kind of thing that we want to continue to promote and uh, where we think uh, the BRT can be very helpful. Um, but in the meantime, a, a big chunk of my job is just making sure that we help to con uh, contain the damage that's being done inside the Middle East, and then hopefully over time build uh, towards a better future there. Uh, that's, that's not a two-year project. That's going to be a longer-term project. 
That was a long answer, but it was a big question, right? He's, he said he wanted to go around the world, and I did that pretty fast. All right. Yeah. In the back, Fred. Yeah. Uh, Mr. President, you mentioned uh, infrastructure in your opening remarks, and the BRT, I think, would uh, echo the fact that our highways and bridges are deteriorating and the lack of investment is creating congestion, which is um, retarding economic activity. I want my FedEx package <laughs> moving <laughs> smooth. Through, and, our, um, through our infrastructure. 60 Minutes did a very good uh, piece on this problem uh, the other day. So uh, the Highway Trust Fund, which uh, provides the funding for all of these infrastructure improvements, uh, ran out of money in August, and it was papered over with a, with a patch uh, right. based on some pension accounting. So now you have uh, bipartisan bills in both the Senate from Senator Corker, a Republican, and Senator Murphy of Connecticut. You have, as of yesterday, a bipartisan bill in the House with Congressman Petrie, a Republican, and Congressman Blumenauer, uh, a Democrat. And you've had uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, head and the head of the AFL-CIO jointly testify in Congress about the Highway Trust Fund, uh, uh, the gasoline and, and diesel tax. Uh, and you've got the entire uh, industry uh, supporting an increase in highway uh, taxation to fund these infrastructure improvements. So why not before you, uh, before the Congress goes home for December, just pass a bill that uh, in, uh, takes uh, the two uh, bipartisan bills that I just mentioned uh, up and solves the problem because come May it's going to, to uh, run out of money again because the, the, the patch is over. I would think that would be a great opportunity for the, you and the new Congress to show some bipartisan uh, success here. I tell you, Fred, that the uh if I were running Congress, I'd, I'd potentially take you up on that offer uh, or suggestion. I think I would have, uh, probably already would have done it. Um, in fairness to members of Congress, uh, votes on gas tax are really tough. Uh, gas prices are one of those things that really bug people. <laughs> Uh, when they go up, they're greatly attuned to them. When they go down, they don't go down enough. Uh, and, and so uh, historically, I think there's been great hesitance. And so, so I, I guess what I do is separate out, Fred, uh, a short-term problem and a long-term problem. Uh, short-term is we've got to replenish the, the Highway Trust Fund. Uh, and uh, I will engage with Speaker Boehner and McConnell to see what they think they can get done to make sure that we're not running out of money. Because we've got a whole bunch of construction projects that are in train right now that, you know, set aside the stuff that we need to do, just keeping going on the stuff that uh, is currently operating uh, would be endangered if we, if we don't replenish it. The, the, the question is going to be, is there a formula long term for us to get a dedicated revenue source for funding the infrastructure that we need that is not so politically frightening to members of Congress that it's reliable. So the gas tax hasn't been increased for 20 years. There's a reason for that. Uh, and if, if that's your primary source of revenue, when the populations, I don't know what it's done, but it's gone up X percent. Uh, GDP has gone up X percent. Uh, we've, we've got, I mean, you know, your business, Fred, is, has, has completely transformed uh, over the last uh, two decades, and yet we still have the same mechanism to try to keep up. It's probably a good time for us to redesign and think through how to, what is a sustainable way 
for us on a regular basis to uh, make the investments we need. Um, and this may be something that we can introduce into the tax reform agenda. Uh, it may end up being too complicated and we've got to do something uh, separate. But, but we've got to figure this out. We are falling behind. I, you know, Dave, you were asking earlier about China. Uh, I, I do not take potential competition from China lightly, but I am absolutely confident we've got better cards than China does. And, and I'd much rather have our problems than China's problems. That I'm confident about. On the other hand, the one thing I will say is that if they need to build some stuff, they can build it. And over time, that wears away our advantage competitively. It, it, it's embarrassing. You know, you, you drive down the roads and you look at uh, what they're able to do. But the place that we stayed at uh, for the, the APEX summit uh, was this lavish, you know, con uh, conference center. And uh, it, uh, it probably put most of the conference centers here to, to, to shame. They had built it in a year. Now, you've got an authoritarian government uh, you know, that isn't necessarily accountable. I understand we're not going to do that. Uh, but uh, if they're able to build their ports, their airports, their smart grid, their you know, air traffic control systems, uh, their broadband systems, uh, in, in with that rapidity, and they're highly superior to ours, over time that's going to be a problem for us. Uh, so, so Fred, I, I guess the, the answer is I'm, I'm going to talk to McConnell and Boehner to see what we can do short term and to see whether these bipartisan bills have any legs. They'll have a better sense of head counts, and I'll have to talk to Harry Reid uh, and Nancy Pelosi as well. Um, but even if we were able to get something done, it would not be the kind of 10-year solution that we need. Uh, it, it, the best I suspect they could do would be to stagger through another year. And we've got to have a, a better way of planning uh, and, and executing uh, on infrastructure investment. And I'll be engaging with the BRT and you, hopefully, uh, who are, and others who are interested to see if we can come up with something. And I've got to check in with Larry to see if he's figured out whether we can get all that, uh, all that global capital on the sidelines to start uh, helping us fund some, uh, some uh, infrastructure projects here in the United States. Yeah, Greg. So just to pivot back to uh, immigration for a minute, yeah. um, it remains a top priority, mm -hmm. unequivocally, of, uh, of BRT. We are of the mind that the policy and the politics can still align sometime in 2015. Mm -hmm. We are steadfast and consistent in comprehensive or broad-based reform and all the components that come with that. Uh, we agree with you on timing. Maybe it's for whatever, second quarter, summer, whatever it ends up being. Right. But there's still an opportunity to do that. As we go down this path in what appears to be uh, a piecemeal approach with multiple bills that can advance, I just wanted to make the comment, we all collectively need to be mindful of the sequencing and the packaging of those individual pieces of legislation and how they're viewed, so we don't talk past each other. Yeah. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So I do, and uh, the uh, I mean, Greg, uh, look, I mean, l let's be blunt. Uh, BRT has a great interest in in the high skill visa issue and H-1Bs, and making sure that STEM graduates uh, are available to to work and uh, ultimately start businesses here in the United States. I'm, in, uh, I'm for that as well. There was a limit to how much we could do on that front through executive action, because something like H-1B visa numbers are clear, statutory, not subject to a lot of uh, executive uh, interpretation. Uh, but for example, we, we, we could administratively uh, make sure that folks who had been approved for green cards, that process was accelerated so that they weren't stuck and, and their employers weren't hobbled uh, in terms of utilizing that, uh, those personnel uh, in a more efficient, effective way. Um, so that's component one. 
and I know that's preeminent interest uh, to this room. Uh, there's an agricultural component. There wasn't a lot we could do administratively on the ag sector, uh, but those whose businesses uh, you know, uh, keep track of, uh, and are related to what happens in agriculture understand that uh, we should have a more efficient system uh, for managing fairly, justly, agricultural workers who are vital to the economy. And frankly, this is one of the few areas where it genuinely is true that it's hard to find Americans to do those jobs. Sometimes that's overstated. Sometimes the question is, and, and I hope I'm not offending anybody here, but sometimes when folks say we can't find anybody, it's just you don't want to pay as much as uh, you, you'd have to to find some folks. Uh, but in the ag sector, that's hard work and it's hard to find enough uh, American-born workers to actually get it done. Uh, but we've got to treat them fairly and, and make sure that it's, it's, uh, it's good for workers and good for business. That we could not do much about through executive uh, action. So th those are two big components that are of interest to this group that need to get done. Um, border security, th the truth is we're already doing a lot. We're going to be doing more as a consequence of the executive actions. There was a spike in concern about the borders because those kids had been coming up from Central America during the summer and it got two weeks of wall-to-wall -wall coverage until everybody forgot about it. Um, it does reflect real problems in Central America with their economies and violence, but also active marketing by smugglers to parents saying that they could get kids in. Uh, we've brought that back down so the numbers are now below what they were two years ago. Overall, uh, the border is less porous than it's been any time since the 1970s, and we make huge investments down there. We can still do more, but the truth is we're, we're working that uh, part of it real hard. And then there's the issue that I did deal with in executive actions, although not for everybody, and that is uh, the 11 million people who are here uh, undocumented, but the vast majority who are law-abiding. Uh, and, and the one principle, I guess, if in fact we can still get a comprehensive deal going forward, even if it's somewhat piecemeal, is uh, I, I am not going to preside over a system in which uh, we know these folks are in the kitchens of most restaurants in the country, are cleaning up most of the hotels that all of you stay in, uh, that are doing the landscaping in most na neighborhoods where you live, uh, whose kids are going to school with our kids, and we tolerate it because it's good for, for us economically uh, to have cheap labor and services, but we never give them a path to be part uh, of this country in a more full and fair way. Um, that's just not who we are. That's not how most of our forebears got to the point where we had the opportunities we've got today. And, and I, so I'm not going to perpetuate a system uh, of that sort. Uh, I've taken executive actions. What I'd like to see, and I'm happy to negotiate, is to see if we can solidify that into law. Um, uh, but, but it's going to be hard, I think, for me and for other Democrats to vote for a big package that says, all right, we're going to still not deal with that and just deal with uh, those aspects of it uh, that are of core concern to the BRT. It doesn't mean I can't have that conversation, but I want to be honest about the complications of, of us uh, doing something piecemeal. Well, and we support. I know you do. The components. Oh, you guys, you guys are all there. Ag, okay. You guys have been terrific on this. I, I have no complaints at all. Uh, and, in fact, I have only gratitude for the way that the BRT stepped up. I, I think everybody here sincerely understands what, uh, uh, what immigration has meant to, to the life of this country. And just in terms of macroeconomics, I, this is something that is it's, uh, not a sexy argument to make to the public, but we are younger than our competitors. And that is entirely because of immigration. And when you look at the problems that China, Japan, 
Europe, Russia are all going to have. A lot of it just has to do with they're getting old. And we stay young because we're constantly being replenished by these striving families uh, from around the world. And, and we should want th that to continue. Uh, all right, I'll take two more. What the heck? All right. Right back here and then right over here. Is that uh, U.S. Trade Representative Michael Froman uh, is doing a Herculean job of driving trade agreements around the world. Um, it seems to be common sense that uh, the more access to global trade is, is good for the creation of U.S. jobs. Um, how can we get TPA passed so that Michael can have the clear support that he needs to drive these agreements? Uh, well, I'm going to be talking to uh, uh, McConnell and, and Boehner, uh, Reed and Pelosi, and, and uh, making a strong case on the merits as to why this has to get done. Um, it is somewhat challenging because of a factor that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, Americans feeling as if their wages and incomes have stagnated. And there's a half-truth that uh, is, is magnified, I think, in the discussions around trade, that global competition has contributed to some of that wage stagnation. It's an appealing argument. I think it, when you look at the numbers, it's actually an incorrect argument that over time, growth, investment, exports all have increased the capacity for uh, working families to, to uh, improve their economic standing. But I say it's a half-truth because there's no doubt that some manufacturing uh, moved offshore uh, in the wake of China entering the WTO and, uh, and, and uh, as a consequence of NAFTA. Now, more, more of those jobs were lost because of automation uh, and capital investment. But uh, there's a narrative there that makes for some tough politics. Uh, we have to be able to talk directly to the public about why trade is good for America, good for American businesses, and good for American workers. And we have to dispel some of the myths. Um, part of the argument that I'm making to Democrats uh, is don't fight the last war. You already have. If somebody has wanted to outsource, if any of the companies here wanted to locate in China, you've already done it. If you want to, you know, locate in a low-wage country with low labor standards and low environmental standards, there hasn't been that much preventing you from doing so. Um, and ironically, if we are able to get Trans-Pacific Partnership done, then we're actually forcing some countries to boost their labor standards, boost their environmental, mineral, uh, environmental standards, boost transparency, uh, reduce corruption, increase intellectual property protection. And so all that's good for us. Those who oppose uh, these trade deals, ironically, uh, are accepting a status quo uh, that is more damaging to American workers. So, and I, 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 I'm going to have to engage directly with our, uh, our friends in labor and our uh, environmental organizations and, and, and try to get from them why it is that they think that, for example, Mike is in a conversation with Vietnam, one of the potential uh, uh, signatories to the TPP. Now, right now, there are no labor rights in Vietnam. I, I don't know how it's good for labor for us to tank a deal that would require Vietnam to improve its laws around uh, labor organization and safety. I mean, we're not punishing them somehow by leaving them out of something like this. Let, let's bring them in. Um, on the environmental front, okay, I, I haven't looked carefully at uh, uh, the environmental laws in Malaysia recently, 
but I suspect they're not as strong as they are here. It's not a bad thing for us to nudge them in a better direction, particularly since we now know that environmental problems somewhere else in the world are going to ultimately affect us. So uh, I, 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 I think that there are folks in my own party and in, in, in uh, my own uh, constituency uh, that have legitimate complaints about some of the trend lines of inequality, but are, are, are barking up the wrong tree when it comes to opposing TPP, and, and I'm going to have to uh, uh, make that argument. Um, but I, I will tell you, uh, though, when, when you talk to Boehner and McConnell, that some of those same anti-trade impulses uh, are more ascendant in the Republican Party than they might have been 20 years ago as well. Uh, and as some of you may have encountered those uh, in some of your conversations. Um, and, and this is why it goes back to the, the, the point, we're not going to get trade done, we're not going to get infrastructure done, we're not going to get anything done in this town until we're able to describe to the average American worker how at some level this is improving their wages, it's giving them the ability to save for retirement, it's improving their financial security. Uh, if people continue to feel like uh, Democrats are looking after poor folks and Republicans are looking after rich folks and nobody's looking after me, um, then we don't get a lot of stuff done. And, 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 and the trend lines you know, are evidence the fact that uh, uh, folks have gotten squeezed. And, and obviously 2007, 2008 really ripped, uh, 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 ripped open uh, for people uh, how vulnerable they were. All right. Nick. Mr. President, thank you for being here today. Uh, we talked about many issues that are on the school system agenda for the Census Roundtable. One of the, one of the real pervasive issues that I know you've talked about before is the regulatory burden in this country. Mm -hmm. And still it remains the major issue that, that many of us deal with. Um, in my industry, American Electric Power, uh, we're in the midst of a major transition in our industry. Uh, we have environmental rules, obviously, that we continue to advance, um, have done quite a good job of, of uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and so forth. Um, and, I, and I know that you know, we've had uh, billions being spent on mercury removal um, at, the, at the time when we're now having greenhouse gas rules being put in place, that even independent system operators say that there, there'll be uh, impacts on the reliability of the grid. And I know you've been, you've been uh, uh, seriously responsible um, and involved with uh, the reliability implications of our grid post Superstorm Sandy yeah. uh, from a cyber physical standpoint. Uh, and it really is interesting uh, for us to see this transition occurring. We've got to be reasonable and rational. And it goes to the overall regulatory question. Um, how do we continue to make progress? And I'd like just your views on, you talked about this before, how do you see the progress has been made and what do you anticipate occurring in the next couple of years uh, relative to removing some of this regulatory burden that, that in fact makes us all uh, uncompetitive? Uh, I, I think it's a great question. It's probably a good, a good place to close because I think there's an area where I, I'd like to see uh, us do more together. Um, I've said before to my staff, I've, I haven't said this publicly, so, uh, so I've got to be careful here. You get a little looser uh, in your last two years' office, maybe. <laughs> um, that, uh, and there's a little tongue in cheek, but, but it, uh, it, it'll get to a point. Um, that the, re the Republicans, uh, and maybe I'd throw the BRT in here, are, are actually about 25% right when it comes to regulatory burden. Uh, now, you, you'd say the numbers are different. Um, but what I mean by that is uh, nobody wants to be regulated. And uh, there are some regulations that uh, are burdensome on businesses. They'd rather not do them. But the common good that is served is sufficiently important. The benefits so outweigh the costs that, as a society, we should go ahead and do them. And 
we were talking about China earlier. I will just point to one simple example, and that is you would not want your kids growing up in Beijing right now because they could not breathe. And the fact of the matter is that used to be true in Los Angeles as recently as 1970. And the reason it changed was because of the Clean Air Act. And in my hometown of Chicago, the Chicago River caught fire uh, right around the same period. And because of the Clean Water Act, you now have folks paddling down the water and fishing. And the commercial uh, renaissance of downtown Chicago is in large part driven by a really big, radical piece of environmental legislation that at the time people said would destroy our businesses and our competitiveness. So there is an example of something that it, it's inconvenient, it's tough, but it's the right thing to do. And over time, I actually think it's not only good for our quality of life, it's actually good for our economy. Because we've got some really innovative companies here, and you guys figure out how to adapt to those regulations. But remember what I said at the beginning. You're actually about 25 percent right. The, what is absolutely true is, is that as we comb through our regulatory structures, there are old regulations that have outlived their usefulness. You know, you have regulations, railroads that don't take into account GPS. And <laughs> so they have folks doing a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't acknowledge technologies uh, that, that have, have sprung up over the last 20 years. Um, you have regulations that are poorly written. You've got regulations that uh, are not properly synced up so that uh, you have different agencies with different responsibilities, and so compliance costs end up skyrocketing. Uh, you have regulations that uh, squash innovation because uh, s at times some of the agencies, the regulatory agencies, treat every problem like a nail and only have a hammer uh, and aren't engaging with industry enough to think, all right, here's the problem we're trying to solve. Is there a smarter way of solving it? So what we've tried to do is to set up a structure in which we can engage directly with various industries, explain, here's the goal we're trying to accomplish, solicit as much feedback as possible, and then try to design uh, systems that provide some flexibility, allow for creative adaptation, but still hit the mark, still hit the goal. And for example, on the power plant rule, which obviously you're having to spend a lot of time with, um, I recognize that there's a big expense for a lot of companies. Um, on the other hand, I think Gina McCarthy's tried to have a sufficiently open process so that she's working with not only industry, but on a state-by-state -state basis, recognizing not every state's the same, to figure out is there a smarter way for us to do this, but still meet the mark of reducing our overall carbon emissions. Um, what I'd like to do in these last two years is figure out how we can uh, improve the system to find that 25 percent. And again, we may not always agree on what the 25 percent is. And can we institutionalize it so that it outlives not uh, you know, my administration? We already instituted a cost-benefit analysis system. Uh, that, or we inherited one that had been instituted. It was controversial for a while, mostly criticism from Democrats. I, I actually believe in, in cost benefit. I, I think it makes sense for us to engage in a vigorous review. And there has, and, and my essential rule has been, we're not going to promulgate new regulations unless you can show a significant benefit relative to costs. Um, and we've been able to do that. We've been able to document it in the most rigorous way pro possible. But are there some other institutional things we can do to build the process? So for example, uh, there's more input on the front end rather than the rule gets promulgated, published, and then there's this big, cumbersome, inefficient, unwieldy process of comments. And maybe are there, are there smarter ways of doing that? Um, we're spending a lot of time on the regulatory look back process digging back into old rules and seeing what don't make sense. Um, 
so what I'd like people to do, uh, the BRT to do, is perhaps industry by industry, work with Jeff, uh, and you know, let's inventory. What are, what are the rules that bother you most? We'll go through them. I'll tell you, you know, if it's child labor laws, I'm probably going to hang on to them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if you know, we're, we're going to keep that rule, if it's, if it's uh, you know, some, some basic uh, issues around environmental protection, I, I'm going to be wanting to preserve them. But in, tho in those instances where there's significant costs, I may say, we're not going to change the goal. Do you think there's a smarter way to doing this? Because we're willing to listen if, if you think there is. Uh, less command control, more market incentive, we're, we're open to it. Um, and on that list, I suspect there may be four or five s regulations out of 20, 25, where you can persuade us, you know what, this actually should just be eliminated. It doesn't make sense anymore. Or it should be replaced. And we will be open to doing that. I, the job council that we put together, uh, that some of you participated in, gave us a list of recommendations. And, and some of them involved, for example, streamlining infrastructure projects. We adopted almost all those recommendations. And business was absolutely right. It wasn't that they minded ha having an environmental review. They didn't like the idea of having you know, permitting, environmental review, all this stuff go uh, consecutively. And you end up with a eight-year time frame when, if you put it on parallel tracks, you could compress it down to one year. Well, so we are open to common sense. Um, and and uh, what I, I have assigned Jeff to do and my entire cabinet to do, Penny Pritzker and uh, Tom Perez and others, is to sit down and listen to you. And if you can show us either that something is counterproductive and doesn't work or there's a smarter way of meeting the goal, we will, we will uh, embrace it happily. Um, there are going to be times, though, where we just disagree on the goal. Uh, and, and I'm going to be able, you know, worker safety. I, my instruction to Tom Perez is I want our workers to be safe. And we now do have the, probably the safest wake, workforce that we've ever had in history. Made huge strides on that, partly because of just continuous improvement that you've instituted in your own companies. It's been good for workers. It's been good for business. Um, but frankly, if it hadn't been for some initial laws to prod you, some of it just wouldn't have happened. Uh, so we're going to hang on to worker safety rules. The question then is going to be, is there a way, for example, for us to enforce it in a more efficient way, in a less disruptive way, but continues to hold you accountable? That, that's a conversation Tom Perez is going to be happy to have. All right? Happy holidays, everybody. Uh, it's good to be in America. God bless us. Thank you.